Hello friends. This, well this is not actually a Laten style Celtic sword. This is an early migration era Spatha. But it does directly descend from the Laten style sword, which was adopted into the Roman cavalry during the Second Punic War via Gaulish mercenaries. But this makes the Laten style sword the grandfather of all later medieval Western European swords. Now, what do we mean when we say Laten? Laten is a place in Switzerland and this place became associated with the identified artistic style that is what we now call Latin. And, you know, generally it's associated with the Celts, and it was certainly generated by them, but it's not necessarily exclusive to them. So although it's centered in Gaul, and sort of spread out from Gaul, it went sort of wherever the Celts went, but it was also adopted by some Germanic peoples. Now, when we're talking about the swords, there is a distinction to be made. There is really three periods of Laten that are important to us. So there is the first period, where the swords are sort of shorter uh, and very pointed. And they're more like the Roman gladius. And it's during this time period that the Roman gladius was adopted by the Romans and uh, mainly influenced or derived from the designs that they encountered when they were fighting Celts. There is a stage two where the sword blades are still tapering slightly towards a point, but they're getting longer, they're getting less pointed. And then there's a stage three, uh, late Latin. And by this period, the, the points are not very pointed at all, and the swords are quite long, some of them very long, some of them as long as European medieval long swords. So you're seeing 36 inches in the blade in some of these examples. Rare examples, but they exist. And it's thought that this transition might reflect a transition in fighting styles. So of course, you're going to need a different kind of weapon if you're fighting differently. Now, it's interesting that they would transition from cut and, and thrust to purely slashing, but it may relate to cavalry. And that is, we have a lot of Gallic noblemen becoming very uh, associated with cavalry, right? And we see this in the Gallic Wars of Julius Caesar. And so a, a long sword that you can use effectively from cavalry is likely one possible reason for the switch. And we see that the Spatha used by the Roman cavalry first and later with infantry developed from exactly this kind of sword used by uh, the Celtic mercenaries in the Second Punic War. Because the Roman military didn't have a very good sword to use from horseback at that time. So every region was a little bit different. So in Ireland, for instance, and in Britain, the swords seem to have been relatively shorter. And the reason for this, I think, is because we don't see that switch in combat style. So in Britain and Ireland, they're still using chariots primarily. They're not really using uh, direct horseback riding in the majority of cases. Now, obviously, there is light cavalry there, but it's not quite as developed to the level that it was in Gaul. They're still relying a lot on chariot use, and so the fighting from chariot is a lot different than the fighting from horseback, and so the swords reflect this, perhaps. But we also know from Roman sources that these large swords were not simply used from horseback. The infantry were definitely using them as well. And in every case, what they record is a style of fighting where this, the soldier raises their hand above their head and brings the sword down with their full force. And so this is a fighting style that is very brutal. 
they repeat often that it's as if they were trying to cut every piece of their enemy apart right so they are giving it with everything they've got right they are just hacking and slashing away and this leads us to the other charge that the romans lay on these swords and sa they say that these swords would bend on the first strike and that they would ha then have to bend them over the knee to straighten them again so that they could keep fighting effectively is there any truth to this well maybe and that reason lies in the fact that they were primarily iron there is some examples where the edge was steel but the vast majority of them were iron and the vast majority of them also were not necessarily uh, quenched iron either so they were not water quenched or oil quenched and so um, they were relatively soft relatively flexible this has advantages and disadvantages and it's thought that they intentionally made them flexible so that they wouldn't break as easily because if you have a long iron blade um, and the whole thing is is very hard it can snap on you and that's definitely not what you want in battle it's better to have a slightly bent sword than it is to have a broken sword but we know that the smiths were extremely proficient and they were experimenting with many different techniques that we would later associate with different cultures so they are doing folding and this is a technique generally associated with the Japanese um, forging of katanas. But the Celts were doing it as early as 400 BC. This helps to even out uh, the material that you're working with, works out slag and other inclusions in the iron. And so it does, it does produce a better iron. They were also doing welding techniques, so layered welding and they were doing this, you know, taking different layers of different metals and layering them together and welding them together to create uh, a, one solid piece. And they would often have fullers down the blade as well, uh, sometimes double fullers. Uh, but the blades, especially during the later period, were very wide, very hefty, and certainly I don't know the exact statistics um, on an average but just by looking at them, they look like they would be fairly weighty in the hand. And so not nimble um, fencing weapons, you would say. But this is because they were using them together with a shield, of course. And so there is no idea that you would be trading blows back and forth with a sword. You would be striking with a sword. You would be defending yourself with your shield. And the scabbards were also often elaborately decorated and they use like kind of floral motifs or vegetal motifs as they say so they look like vines going around the scabbard and many of them are very beautiful and it's unfortunate that most of the the scabbards that we have are also made of iron but because we often find them to, in this the sword in the scabbard if it's deposited in water, deposited in peat bogs or something like this, where we find them preserved, oftentimes they become, the sword has become fused with the scabbard. And so it's very hard to get them apart or to examine um, the blade inside because it's, it's been made inseparable from the sheath without destroying the entire thing. But one of the features that we see on these scabbards is also this double dragon motif. Now we don't see this example in any of the surviving Irish swords, but uh, there are some interesting mythological parallels that perhaps I won't get into in detail here, uh, but they, they certainly exist. There's various different figures that are said to take uh, serpents or snakes or worms in both hands. And I guess we can transition from that observation to the pummels. But what's really interesting is that a lot of these pummels, especially on the smaller models, not so much the, the longer ones, but on the smaller swords or even the large daggers, is that they have um, a humanoid figure as the pummel. Now, it's possible that this is supposed to represent 
the spirit of the weapon. This is only, of course, my own theory, but given that we know from Iris sources that swords were thought to have spirits, at least a certain people with certain abilities could maybe talk to these swords, because we see Ogma, um, a god of battle, who is likened to Heracles, and he talks to these swords. And we actually see this sort of myth carried on in some Japanese video games and stuff. If you have ever played those Tales games, like Tales of Destiny, that's the one I remember the best. Uh, they have swords that also have souls that, that talk to people and actually partake in the storyline. So did they really bend as much as the Romans say? They probably bent some because they are soft iron, right? And they're being swung with the full force. Remember the how it's described that they raise their swords. In every case, the, when the Romans are describing their, their style of attack, they say that they raise their swords above their heads and bring them down as if they're trying to cut people in two. This is describing someone who's putting every single ounce of force that they possibly can into that strike. And so, yeah, it's possible that they, they would bend under the, these sorts of intense situations. But it's not likely that they bend all the time or that, you know, they bent on the first swing in every case, right? No one would use a sword if they were doing that in every case. So, yeah, it's, it's simply an over-exaggeration of something that certainly would have happened occasionally in some instances. But the most significant thing in my mind is that the Latin period sword formed the basis of nearly all Western European swords to come because it formed the basis of the Spatha, which then formed the basis of the migration period Spatha, which I showed you, which formed the basis of the Germanic, later Germanic swords and the Norse Viking swords, right? So all of these things are, are really influencing all of the swords in the later medieval period. So even though the Romans down talk uh, the Celtic swords, think about it. They adopted the gladius from the Celts. They adopted the spatha from the Celts, right? Both, both the swords that they used came from the Celts, and but yet they sit there and talk about how terrible the Celts swords are, right? So this is just sort of a Roman, a Roman thing. And one commentator said it very well, an ancient commentator, I think it was Suculus, said that the Phoenicians are good for making money uh, and the Romans are good for knowing what to take from other people. Paraphrasing, of course, but it's something to that effect, that the Romans know how to take what is useful from other people and to use it for themselves, to make it their own. And that's exactly what the Romans do. So there you have it. The Latin sword is the grandfather of the European medieval sword. Hope you liked the video, and if you did, please hit that like button, subscribe, and consider joining me on Patreon to make requests like this video, which was requested by one of my Patreon supporters. Thank you very much. And as always, stand tall.